stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. You know what my biggest nightmare is? Having the whole script done and then looking at the opener and I got nothing for the opening bit. Well, we don't have to do an opening bit. But it's how we start the show. Yeah, but what I'm saying is it's our show. We get to do whatever we want. Whatever we want? Yeah. So I can talk about Spike? Well, he wasn't in the episode, but sure, if you want to talk about Spike, we can talk about Spike. For instance, I can ask you if you still find him attractive even when he's in vamp face. Yes, because I like him for who he is and not what he looks like. Although that's not bad either. How many episodes until school hard? Five more. I can make it. Let's go. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast. I'm story expert and scary knife-wielding clown Lonnie Diane Rich of Chipperish Media. And I'm film scholar and depressive harpy nightmare woman Noelle LaCroix. <laughs> and we're here today to talk about Nightmares, the 10th episode of season one. Nightmares was written by, well everyone. We have a story by credit for Joss Whedon, story editor credits to Matt Kine, Joe Reinkmeyer, Rob Desotel, and Dean Batali, with the teleplay by David Greenwald. It was directed by Bruce Seth Green, who we last saw directing The Pack. A warning before we begin, every episode of Still Pretty talks about each episode within the greater context of all of Buffy, and as such is fully spoiled. So, Mom, please don't kiss me in front of the guys. <laughs> Nightmares deals with the very serious issue of child abuse. And statistically speaking, that's something you may have experienced. Um, so take good care and sit this one out if you need to. All right, let's go on patrol. In Nightmares, a young boy shows up around the high school and weird things start happening. A kid who has nightmares about spiders gets attacked by spiders. Xander goes to class and is suddenly naked. Giles gets lost in the stacks and can't read. And Buffy's father shows up to tell her that she's the reason he left the family. You know, I don't think it's very mature getting blubbery when I'm just trying to be honest. Speaking of which, I don't really get anything out of these weekends with you. So what do you say we just don't do them anymore? Buffy sees an article in the paper about a boy who was attacked and is in a coma in the hospital and realizes it's the same boy she's been seeing around the school. When she tries to talk to him about it, a club-handed monster guy attacks them both. Buffy can't beat him, so they run. Who is he? He's the ugly man. He's too strong. I can't fight him. We have to find my friends that can help us. Reality starts to slip away around Sunnydale. Willow is forced to perform an opera she doesn't know in front of a rough crowd, while Xander follows a trail of chocolate bars to a clown with a knife. Buffy and Billy find themselves in the cemetery at nighttime, and the master shows up, attacking Buffy and burying her alive. What's the fun of burying someone if they're already dead? Giles, Willow, and Xander find Buffy, who has risen as a vampire. They rush to the hospital to try to wake up Billy so the nightmares can end, and the club-handed monster attacks again. Buffy faces him down. Scary. I'll tell you something, though. There are a lot scarier things than you, and I'm one of them. Buffy knocks Clubby McGee out, and Billy's astral projection finishes the job, pulling off his mask, and Billy wakes up. 
The world is returned to normal just as Billy's little league coach visits to check on Billy. When he sees Billy is awake, he tries to run, but Xander and Giles stop him as Billy finally stands up to him. You said it was my fault that we lost. It wasn't my fault. There's eight other players on the team. You know that. In the normal world, Buffy goes off to spend the weekend with her father, who apparently remembers none of what happened, or it wasn't really him, or something. Whatever. Willow confronts Xander about seeing Buffy as a vampire. When Buffy was a vampire, you weren't still, like, attracted to her, were you? Willow, how can you... I mean, that's really bent. She was... grotesque. Still dug her, huh? I'm sick. I need help. Okay, so Noelle, Nightmares. Yes. What do you think? I How'd you re- like this one? I really, really like this episode. Okay, all I right. really like it. Um, you know how I feel about dream sequences and dream worlds, though. Sure. And, and you know I know how, I how feel. you feel about those <laughs> things. What do you think of Nightmares? It's not my favorite episode. Um I I generally find trying to keep all of the reality together and understand what is actually happening to be something of a challenge here. And I don't feel like we get real textual answers to that. So it's all a little weird for me. Um, But I like that you, you know, pull that symbolism out and you like seeing those connections. And so I think I might like it better once you're done talking about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's definitely dreams and and nightmares and and dream realities are definitely Mm -hmm. um, kind of a slippery slope as far as symbolism goes, because you can end up in the situation where we're just going to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks because it's kind of vaguely symbolic and that feels Mm -hmm. meaningful, right? Um, Yeah. You know, on the one hand, but then you also have the opportunity to really um, go deep into some symbolism and some great uh, characterization through symbolism because things don't need to make sense in objective Mm -hmm. reality. You can Mm -hmm. have um, Buffy and Billy escape through a hedge only to end up in the cemetery at nighttime. So it, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky thing. And with as many writers as we have on this episode, I'm (laughs) right. um, You know, I, I don't think it's a perfect episode. Um, it's a little bit messy and it's really unclear as to mm-hmm. what happens objectively in reality. Mm-hmm. Do people remember what they saw? Was the master really free? We don't really get an answer to that. Um, yeah. yeah, but I love this episode for all of the symbolism um, that the the uh, director and the production designer in particular get to use. Um, something I haven't been talking about in the visual language of Buffy is the mm-hmm. production design. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, production designers were, I mean, I figure everybody listening to this podcast knows what a production designer is, but just mm-hmm. in case you don't, um, production designers work with directors, cinematographers, and producers to tell the story visually. Um mm-hmm. So they style the world of the film or television show. And when you're responding to a setting or a set piece or an object in a work of on-screen fiction, that's the production designer's work that you're seeing and appreciating. Um, yeah. And, you know, for those of you who do trivia nights, um, mm-hmm. the term production designer was coined by William Cameron Menzies while he was working on the 1939 film Gone with the Wind. Keep wow. that in your back pocket for trivia <laughs> night. Um, this is also, you'll also hear production designers called the art director um, mm-hmm. before and since then. That's the same yeah. role. Um, and for the first season of Buffy, Steve Hardy is our production designer. And there's a lot of great production design in season one of Buffy. Um, Mm -hmm. We have the Masters underground broken down church, Mm -hmm. you know, Buffy's feminine and realistically cluttered bedroom. Yes. (laughs) The most gorgeous high school library you will ever see. Oh, yeah. Um, if if you know of a more gorgeous high school library, please um, post a picture to Twitter. Send pictures, yes. Send <laughs> pictures. I'm a bit of a library nerd, so send me send me all your book pictures. I love them. <laughs> um, and the eclectic. We didn't talk about this with the puppet show last time, mm-hmm. but that eclectic, bizarre mix of things that we get backstage at the Sunnydale mm-hmm. High School talent show. Um, yeah. Just fantastic. 
so delightful to me. But my favorite bit of production design so far is the use of posters and signs. Um, Uh Uh-huh. The writing is literally on the wall, folks. I mean, (laughs) it feels a little heavy handed, but Mm -hmm. anytime you see something written on screen, Mm -hmm. whether that's, um, you know, a title or a subtitle or, you know, writing, you know, diegetic writing, uh, Mm -hmm. writing within the world of the the film or television show, I think it's it's uh, interesting and noteworthy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so. We have a lot of posters because we're in a high school, um, posters and signage. So in which we see sweet, innocent Amy at the end standing under a sign that reads clean. Wow. Um, we see Angel standing in front of a watch your step sign. <laughs> um <laughs> And I'm going to be on the lookout for more literal signs as we move forward. There's something just delightfully cheeky to me about having your production design do some of the talking for your narrative. Yeah, Yeah, Um, no, that's really neat because um, one of the things that we tend to kind of filter out, you know, when we're watching TV and movies is kind of all that background stuff, right? You know, mm -hmm. because we're like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just there. But when you have an art designer, a production designer, they are deliberately choosing absolutely everything that goes into that space. There's nothing that's there just randomly because it's there. So finding all of that stuff actually does add to your textual reading of the thing because it is all in there deliberately. So that's something for people to remember that you're like, oh, well, it's just a sign. It's never just a sign. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's anything, whenever there's anything on somebody's T-shirt, whenever, Mm -hmm. I mean, anything that you see graphically, you know, displayed, somebody deliberately chose that thing. And in most cases, I will say not all, you know, but in most cases, there was somebody who put a lot of very deliberate thought into placing it in that particular space. So you will find like a a real extension of meaning by paying attention to those little details. Absolutely. And sometimes it's um, terroir meaning. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's it gets put it gets chosen because it feels right or it just looks right. Um, But when you find yourself thinking those things, or I imagine even in a professional capacity, when a mm-hmm. um, a costume designer or a production designer, you know, is, is choosing something and the feeling is, well, this is just something that Buffy would have, or this is just right. something that Willow would wear. Um, mm-hmm. That says a lot about the kind of character you as the costume designer or art director perceive this character to be based on um, all of that uh, cultural context. Yeah, so there's absolutely. A, there's a lot of meaning that we can pull out of things like um, costume design and production design. Mm-hmm. And in this episode particularly, um, in Nightmares, my favorite bit of signage is um, a visual clue to some subtext that you... Lonnie and everyone listening um, may take some issue with, but I don't care because I think it's fantastic. So, you know, death of the author and all that, right? Death of the author. Yeah. And everybody who's unfamiliar with that idea of death of the author, I don't know if we've talked about it on this particular podcast yet. I don't think we have, no. Yeah, it's, it's this idea that um, that basically the um, whatever is in the text is has meaning. And even if the author or the production designer or whoever was working on it just kind of threw it in without thinking about it, it still carries meaning with it. If you see meaning there, that meaning is there, whether or not the author says it's there or not. And as an author, I can tell you that I have had that experience with myself. Like I have gone back to my <laughs> books. And seen things there that at the time that I was writing them, I had no idea that I was putting that in there. And then I go back to it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, that that's illuminating. You know? <laughs> um, it's, I'll tell you something. If you're an author, there is no greater way to get an insight into your own psyche than to go back and read stuff that you wrote years ago, because you will see things in it of which you're aware now. But at the time that you were writing it, you weren't. So there are all sorts of influences that go into that. And the fact of the matter is, 
that the text is the text. And in a TV show, everything you see, everything you hear, it's all text and it's all up for analysis. There is nothing that is truly meaningless. So go ahead and give me me your thing. What is it? (laughs) So my favorite, my favorite, favorite bit of signage in Mm -hmm. uh, Nightmares, and we have a couple of good sign moments, but my favorite is um, when Buffy follows Billy into the gym. Mm-hmm. There's a Sunnydale banner on the wall behind them, which, as the camera follows them, eventually gets cropped to Sun, S-U-N, mm-hmm. which is a homophone with Sun, S-O-N. Mm-hmm. We have Buffy and Billy talking and not quite juxtaposed, um, mm-hmm. but sort of set up as this this balanced force. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have Buffy and Billy their names are linguistically similar, the B, mm-hmm. short vowel, double consonant, Y. Mm-hmm. And Buffy's primary nightmare at this point in the episode is with her father. Mm-hmm. So we have the idea established of a nightmare father figure already. Um, mm-hmm. We get confirmation at the end that the ugly man is Billy's coach, but the text supports the idea that Billy's coach is also his father. Okay. (laughs) I love the stuff that you, you see things that I would never see. All right. So give me the textual argument that his coach is also his father. Okay. (laughs) So, I mean, there's no question that the coach is the ugly man, right? That is Mm -hmm. pretty Mm -hmm. clearly... Absolutely. You know, we're meant Absolutely. to figure that out. Figure and that the club out. is like a baseball bat and it's very similar. So, yes. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Billy pulls the man, pulls off the ugly man's face and the light of recognition and truth comes streaming out over everything. Sure. And that's when, you know, there's that wonderful confrontation in the hospital room. Um, mm-hmm. And Xander catching the coach as he tries to escape and then Giles helping to hold him there. I'm just like, yeah. All you right. know, mm-hmm. men holding each other accountable for their actions. I love Absolutely. that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but the casting on the Kitty League coach and the casting on Billy really suggests a family resemblance to me. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, and there's no question that the coach is abusing Billy, regardless of their right. mm-hmm. relationship. You know, I think there's no, um, you know, there's no question about that. That's pretty clear. Um, yeah. But uh, Billy's line, you know, and Billy's line, he said it was my fault. Um, it's just so, you know, so reeks of perpetrators blaming their victims for what they're doing to them. And uh-huh. then Billy flinches when Buffy touches his shoulder in this very Mm -hmm. sort of protective, um, paternal way. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then we also have the ugly man's club bat hand arm, which is delightfully creepy and a great Mm -hmm. extension of baseball as horror for this kid. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also phallic in nature. So there we have that dark father idea again. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And then... (laughs) We get a hint of the idea of parent-child abuse in the interaction um, between leather jacket and tiny sunglasses inside guy and his mother. (laughs) How much do I love that guy? Yes. um, But uh, she's kissing him and he doesn't want to be kissed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, yeah, it's played for comedy and this is a nightmare scenario, but that's still non-consensual touching. Yes. Mm-hmm. By a family member. You know, it doesn't matter if it's your family member. It's still, mm-hmm. you know, the rules of consent still apply. Right. Nobody, right, right. No one belongs to anyone else, even if you gave birth to that person. You right. Know? Exactly. Um, and then so so the coach's nickname for Billy is Lucky 19, right? 19 Mm -hmm. is his number. Um, I'm going to get real new agey for a minute and say that in numerology. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. uh, Where are my witches at? In numerology, (laughs) 19 is connected with powerful change in life events. Uh Um, One is leadership. The number one is leadership. I mean, this is really overly simplified, right? We're not going to, this is not, this is not the Buffy the Vampire Slayer numerology podcast. Although if you know of one, (laughs) at me on Twitter. Um, Yes. 
So numerology one really simply is leadership. Nine is philanthropy. So combined, this is a person who serves both the self and others. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the 19th card in the major arcana of the tarot is the sun. There we go Uh again with our homophones, Um, Mm -hmm. which is often depicted as a child, the dawning of a new day, and so Mm -hmm. on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot going on here um, with the sort of significance of childhood and and that you know transformation and then this this line at the end rubs me so the wrong way um xander you know, the buffy and and willow are kind of marveling at the fact that a coach would do this to a child and mm-hmm. xander says you obviously haven't played kitty league i'm surprised it wasn't one of the parents Wow. And even mm-hmm. with this line from Xander, um, I th- think the symbolism is there to back it up in terms mm-hmm. of a closer relationship between Billy and the coach than just coach and and uh, player. Mm-hmm. But that line said with a smile, I think we yeah. just co-sign child abuse you oh, obviously have yeah. played mm-hmm. kitty league is the sports equivalent of boys will be boys isn't it i mean sports will be sports yeah yeah i guess so i mean it's it is said with this very accepting this is just the way it is yeah you know that kids are, are routinely abused in kitty league and xander's surprised it wasn't one of the parents you yeah know? um so calling that out i think is really interesting i'm i'm still not convinced yeah. that textually that the coach is also billy's father i can see that as a, a subtextual kind of reflection on the parental relationships that we have in this episode including you know with giles and buffy mm-hmm. um, giles of course being the light appropriate proper side of that parental relationship when he finds her grave mm-hmm. and says no this is my nightmare i should have done better i should have done more i should have you know helped you i should have prepared you more but mm-hmm. you were so talented and all this kind of stuff that he sees everything in her that her own father does not see, you mm-hmm. know, even when her father isn't the nightmare asshole right. that we get in the middle of it. Right. Right. Um, so so I find that to be I, I, I love I love that you came up with this theory. I mean, <laughs> I love it. I love the fact that I've seen this show. I don't even know how many times and you never fail to surprise me with what you see in it. That delights me. I'm not sure I sign on. I think it's a subtextual thing and maybe not a textual thing, because I think that if you have somebody who plays two roles in your life, you refer to them by the one that's more important. And I think that dad is more important than coach. Um, but, but, he never, uh, but it's yeah, interesting. Billy never refers to him as anything, but he only talks about the ugly man. Mm-hmm. He never refers oh. to his coach. He never uses a name. And it raises the question for me, where are Billy's parents? I was wondering that myself. Where are his parents? But when his when the coach comes in, though, he explains why he's there. I was yeah. just here to check up on Billy and make sure he's OK. But I mean, that's not like a dad doesn't have to explain why he's there. Well, he's obviously lying. He's, <laughs> well, he's, he's well, no, he coming is. He's, in to make sure that Billy's still knocked out. Yeah. yeah. Because mm-hmm. he says, you know, you just want to see how he's, you know, if he's OK. Mm-hmm. And but he's he is terrified when yes. Buffy reveals that Billy is awake. I yes. mean, he is, mm-hmm. he knows he's caught mm-hmm. as soon as she she reveals that. And then Billy yeah. confronts him in, again, you know, I'm, I'm maybe reading this into the text, but confronts him mm-hmm. in what looks to me like a more familial sort of way. The mm-hmm. way Billy, and yes, this is Billy, you know, coming into his power, owning his, you know, his uh, his story and uh, mm-hmm. refusing to be afraid when he repeats Buffy's line, you know, there are eight other people yeah. on the team. You know that. And he says it mm-hmm. so scornfully. Mm-hmm. It feels um, I don't know. There's something there's something very intimate about that confrontation mm-hmm. that, you know, regardless of of what's going on between them this is clearly a deep close relationship you know long-standing um Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. There's something there's something intimate about their relationship between them that I think is unusual for yeah. a coach who is not a close family member or family friend and a child. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I you know, again, yeah, subtextually, I, I'm totally with you. I don't think it's textual, but I, I think it's a fascinating theory. Fair and enough. I love all the work that you did to pull in that textual evidence for it. Um, please keep doing that. Oh. Every week you come up with something and I'm like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> What I don't have of, to agree yeah. to find it delightful. No, no. And I'm not, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. deeply invested in, I was going to say not deeply invested in any of my theories. As we go through, if there are a couple that I'm going to be right. real deeply invested in, I'm like, nope, <laughs> this is the hill I'm going to die on. Um, right. But in general, you know, in general, it's just so delightful for me to pull apart this text. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. Because I think that it really is deliberate in a lot of cases. You know, maybe not, mm-hmm. maybe my reading isn't deliberate, but I get the sense, um, even this early in Buffy mm-hmm. that it's all, it's just packed with meaning. It's all there on purpose. If you see it, if you pull it out as important, if you identify something in it, I think it's there on purpose. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and maybe it is. I mean, we're definitely seeing that theme here. We've got this whole thing with Buffy's dad. Yes. Which I find really interesting. Yes. Um, and, you know, here's the thing, like giving us a broader context for Buffy's dad. This is the first time we interact with him or even, I think, really talk about him. Yeah. Um, during the course of the series. This is the first time. And as we see in the progression of the series, like Hank is a piece of garbage. Like he cheated on Joyce and then just abandoned his daughter. And once we get Dawn in season five, when you retroactively add in that that her existence was there from the beginning for everybody who interacted with her. So it is like she is she's Schrodinger's Dawn, right? She's both there and not there and we observe <laughs> yeah. in the box, right? Yeah. Um yeah. So so I mean he abandoned both both of his daughters, right? Um, he doesn't come for Joyce's funeral um, and just leaves Buffy and Dawn to take care of themselves at that point. I mean, Buffy is technically an adult. She's, you know, like 20, I think at this point, 21, maybe around there. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's also in college. She's still a kid, you know, and yeah. he's not he's not there for them at all. Um, and later, when Buffy and Dawn have no money to keep things going in season six, he's in Spain with his secretary. So he's traversing the world with this woman. Seems to me like he could drop a few dimes in their direction to, like, keep everything going, you know, at the very least, let alone show up take care of them you know right. move into the house like you know be a dad yeah, but he's, be an adult he's not, you know <laughs> right he never even knows that Buffy dies in season five Dawn doesn't tell him and the Buffy bot is making everybody think that Buffy is still alive and they're trying to keep that up but also like Dawn doesn't want him there like Dawn is on to him Dawn mm-hmm. in non-existent space at this point I believe is on to Hank Summers and the kids <laughs> the kids usually are um You know, Buffy says when she's talking to Willow, it's not that she knows it's not her fault that they broke up, but she obviously thinks it is and is carrying that trauma and that guilt with her. Um, Even though, as we find out later, of course, he's a philandering piece of shit, which Joyce does not say. Right? right. Joyce has this interaction. Now, Joyce is uh, is really, you know, in constant, you know, in the in the early days of Buffy, in the early seasons of Buffy. You know, we have there are times where Joyce is a real problem. In this episode, we get really good connected Joyce. Buffy has a nightmare. She's right there. She's waking her up. Um, you know, she says she heard her, you know, heard Buffy call out in her sleep the night before, you know, on, on another night. Um, and she's talking to Buffy about the nightmares and like trying to, to connect with her. Um, and then then we get this moment where she says, are you worried your father isn't going to show? And Buffy says no. But then she's like, well, but should I be? You know, mm-hmm. and obviously she should, because this demonstrates textually that Hank has not been a reliable guy, has been somebody that Buffy needs to worry about. Is he actually going to be here? Mm-hmm. She says multiple times that he comes on the weekends sometimes. And we know that L.A. and Sunnydale are not that far apart. Yeah. It's a couple of hours, maybe, you know. Um, so... What Joyce says is your father adores you. Mm -hmm. And that is a lie. Mm -hmm. Joyce knows that's a lie. She's protecting Buffy, you know, and she's trying not to get in between, 
you know, Buffy and Hank, which I think is the thing that as a parent in a divorce situation, you don't want to do that if if the, you know, if the guy is is okay, if he's right. horrible and abusive and all that kind of stuff, you generally want to keep your kids away from him. But I mean, in general, you want to preserve your kids' relationship with their father, you know, in, mm-hmm. in whatever way that you can. Um, so I really liked Joyce in this episode, even though she wasn't around very much. She was obviously a source of stability. And one thing that, that Buffy didn't worry about, she didn't have nightmares about Joyce. You know, yeah. she knows Joyce is there. Mm-hmm. She's she's like, you know, really secure in her relationship with Joyce. But then we've got, you know, her dad. And we have this this twisted reality, right? In yes. which, you know, like Wendell in the beginning with the spiders, right? Mm-hmm. He's having nightmares about spiders, but those spiders are real. Everybody else experiences them too. Right. So it's a shared reality, right? Mm -hmm. So everything that we're going through here, we have a lot of textual evidence that it's all shared. Wendell didn't imagine this. This is something that actually happened to him. Spiders came crawling out of his textbook. Yes. So we have Hank, right, who shows up and then talks to Buffy, right? And is just the literal worst with everything (laughs) that he does and says. Oh, God. He's he's awful. His Um, matter of fact tone with her i know well we both know that it's just oh it's horrid i know i don't think it's very mature getting all blubbery when i'm just trying to be honest that is such an emotionally abusive thing to say yeah like that is a plus emotional abuse right there that's yeah a high level shithead yeah absolutely so um there's even this moment when she asks him was there someone else Right. Mm -hmm. She knows he had an affair like at that point. And he says, no, no, it was nothing like that. It was you. Right. Which, of course, is her fear and is is based on her fear. But this is all shared reality. So, I mean, you have to kind of think that Hank actually did that. Right. It was actually or is it just. I mean, so that's a question like what. Mm -hmm. What role do real people in the real world have in other people's nightmares when those nightmares become reality right right like the master yeah right? was the master free for a little while was he running around and then all of a sudden when billy wakes up boom he's back stuck in his little dungeon like yeah is, i mean is that the reality well he okay buffy knows what the master looks like from her dreams from her dreams yeah, yeah. But he doesn't he hasn't seen her before in that moment because yeah. he comments mm-hmm. on her appearance Mm-hmm. He says, you're prettier than the last one. Right. You know, mm-hmm. he's a little bit of a patriarchal asshole in that moment. But, you know, well, he's, I mean, he's the, he's he's the master. On the be. list of shitty things oh, that yeah. the master is, I imagine being an, an active and enthusiastic participant in the patriarchy is probably, you know, one of the standard oh, yeah. standard issue things. You know, that's <laughs> that's not even one of the big things. That's, but, no, yeah. that's not even that's not even not <laughs> even on the job interview. For, but absolutely, yeah. I would not expect the master to be like a feminist. No, <laughs> <laughs> that would be surprising, but interesting. Yeah, I would enjoy that. I would really Ooh. enjoy that. But anyway, or claiming to be a feminist as many asshole men do when they are not. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, no, but he comments. He comments on her appearance. Like this is the first time that he's seen her. Um, yeah, and the. That see, I don't know. Is he really? He says is she he says really this there? is she says this is a dream, right? And he's yeah. he mm-hmm. quotes uh, Disney Cinderella at her. Yeah, a dream is a wish. Are we gonna get sued if I sing that on the podcast? I don't think okay. so. <laughs> but it's a, isn't that I thought is that Cinderella? That's Cinderella. That dream. White? Yeah, it's Cinderella. Okay, Disney mm-hmm. Cinderella. The mice and birds wake her up yes, at the beginning. Yes, yes, right. And then mm-hmm. she sings, mm-hmm. "A dream is a wish your heart makes." Mm-hmm. When you're fast asleep, <laughs> in dreams you will lose your heartaches. Sorry. Um, <laughs> would you believe that one of my nightmares is singing in public? I'm with Willow. I wouldn't. Yeah, well, you're so good at it. Yeah. You're such a sport for the opening Face bit that we your did with fears. Darla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, the master in that scene with Buffy in the cemetery suggests that all of this is real because mm-hmm. she fears it. In yes. fact, he says mm-hmm. it's real because, you you know, it's real because you fear it. And then mm-hmm. at the very end, when they're in the hospital and we look out the window, I think it's Willow mm-hmm. looks out the window and there are giant wasps everywhere. I mean, it's the <laughs> end times. Like right. it's everyone's nightmares 
coming uh-huh. true together. Um, right. Xander's murderous clown chases not just Xander, but also Willow and Giles. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, is I mean, giant, to my knowledge, giant wasps are not a real thing in the real world. Right. So those mm-hmm. become reality because someone's nightmare is giant wasps. Right. Is Hank so Summers some the things... asshole? Like, is right. that the same Hank Summers that we see at the end where he's all like... Or is it just a manifest representation? Yeah. You know, it is solely Buffy's fears projected. I mean... Because when he comes to pick her up at school... He's not like, wow, that was really weird before. So sorry. Like, he doesn't seem to be, right. you know, at all. So, and I would imagine that even Hank would be disturbed by that interaction, yes. you know, if, if they actually had it. So I think that we can argue that, like, the clown, mm-hmm. um, you know, the opera singer and the yes. director with Willow, that these are manifestations, such like the spiders are a manifestation, that they're manifestations that other people can experience. But the actual manifestation is just a manifestation. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, all right. I mean, in mm-hmm. the same way that Billy's, it's, you know, there's not a literal mm-hmm. monster who's been, who's beaten Billy into right. a coma. But he, he made it manifest. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that, that suggests, you know, because this is, there is a real person who really mm-hmm. hurt him. Um, and his unconscious has created this monster to right. explain what happened to him. You mm-hmm. know, it couldn't be. It couldn't be his coach. It couldn't be um, this game that he loves. It has mm-hmm. to be this monster. So he right. creates that in this dream space to um, understand, you know, to to protect himself and mm-hmm. also to help himself understand what it is that's going on. Because it's when he pulls that that monster's face off and right. reveals the truth underneath that's when everything goes back to normal right and that's the that's the integration right yes. over on big strong yes one of the things that we had talked about a lot was this this integration of when you're when you're in an abusive situation you're often in denial and you sort of split into two people mm-hmm. you know and um and so until you can completely accept everything that has happened and, you know, and understand that it was all one thing, that the part of you that denied it is also the the, the same as the part of you that knew those two sides mm-hmm. come together and you have to accept everything, right? So here we have kind of a, a representation of exactly that kind of integration that when he pulls the face off the monster, you know, he has accepted that this this monster is his coach yes. that this is the same the man that he trusted the man that you know was supposed to protect him and care for him and and engage with him in this you know really nice fun sport is actually also a monster he is both of those things so the coach is integrated and then of course the coach shows up yes and we see him as a regular man Mm -hmm. but he is absolutely that monster and billy himself fractures into two Mm -hmm. i mean that's that is exactly what gets us into this nightmare space because Mm -hmm. coma plus astral projection which i read as a victim uh dissociating Something yes, that absolutely. happens, mm-hmm. you know, to victims of all kinds of abuse. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Billy separates himself like he he literally goes outside of himself. Yeah. And because mm-hmm. Hellmouth um, that, yeah. you know, because coma, which is the deepest, you know, it's it's um, presented as the deepest sleep. I don't know that mm-hmm. people in comas. I don't know that the comatose state and sleep are similar. Um but for the purposes mm-hmm. of the show, they are. And right. um, Billy is able to appear. I mean, I'm not really clear on, you know, it's funny. I love this episode and I'm not really clear on why any of this happens, but it makes sense yeah. to me. Like it resonates with me on a level that I can't sure. really, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't really articulate. But, you know, so we have, we have the fractured self with Billy as well, that his body uh, that mm-hmm. experienced the trauma is comatose, but his astral body, his soul self, right, is free to move around, and um, it's and be seen and heard. And it's once mm-hmm. Buffy sees him and hears him, um, she notices him repeatedly, and then comes to talk to him, and that's when he starts to 
integrate himself back into himself. Yes. And I love, mm-hmm. I love Buffy, the vampire slayer slash emotional laborer in this episode. Right? <laughs> oh my God. She is mm-hmm. wonderful. She's yeah. absolutely wonderful. When um, they go to talk to Wendell about seeing the spiders and how horrifying that is. And Xander says good talking to you man and then tries to zip off and buffy just grabs him and turns him right back around like nope you are right. not done here mm-hmm. you don't get a cookie yeah. for you know <laughs> you don't get to come pat wendell on the back say you know nice to see you bro and then move on like then, you need yeah. to stay mm-hmm. here and really listen to this this fellow student about his experience um and you know buffy talking to laura in the hospital mm-hmm. is just Oh, it's so painful. It's, and yeah. part of it is that beautiful makeup that they've put on right. on um, the actress who plays Laura. My uh-huh. God, do I believe that she has been hit in the head with something big and heavy. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but Buffy, the way she talks to her is not condescending. You know, it's very mm-hmm. she's very gentle, but she's also very firm. Like You can yes. tell us even if it seems weird. You know, she's mm-hmm. ready Buffy goes into that room ready to believe whatever it is that Laura is going to tell her about the person Mm -hmm. who attacked her. And I just like I just love that so much. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, Buffy talking to Billy, the way that she is with him, the way that um, she's protective of him, but also she's she's a little bit tough with him. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, Billy says it was my fault. And she says, you were the only one playing. There was an eight other people on your team. Like, I just, Mm -hmm. I love the way she um, reframes that for him. Well, yeah. And that's classic in abuse situations. Like the first thing that a victim of abuse does, especially when it's at the hands of somebody who is supposed to love you, somebody Mm -hmm. who's supposed to care for you, which a lot of abuse (laughs) is, you know, Um, it's why it's, it's, you know, an abusive situation that lasts a long time because you have a relationship with your abuser. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that uh, abuse victims do, again, as part of this, this disassociation, which, which, you know, happens until you can finally integrate and understand that you have been abused, that this is, isn't right, is that you do tend to blame yourself. You find a way that it's your fault, because that's the way that it can make sense. Oh, I screwed this up. So I deserve to be hit. You know, Mm -hmm. and it also gives you some sense of control over the situation that, well, if I don't screw up again, then I'm not going to get hit again. And this abusive situation will stop. And of course, that's never the case because it's it's never there's never a reason. The reason why the abuser hurts somebody is because they are abusers. Yes. And that's it. So they will always find a reason and a way and a method to abuse. So um, so the idea of the victim taking on that responsibility and trying to get control over the situation situation is really, really typical. And this is actually, I think, a really good representation of the experience of being abused and what that does to somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, he talks about Billy talks about hiding and, you know, I have to hide and then he comes. And that's that um, process of constantly sort of trying to get away and protect oneself only to find that there is no safe space because mm-hmm. the abuse is um, the abuse is woven into the fabric of the relationship. Yep. This mm-hmm. is not a it's not a stranger um, violence situation. It's a mm-hmm. it's a um, personal relationship. That's yeah, that's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whoo. It's a heavy episode. That's, it is a heavy episode. And I have to say, as I predicted, I am appreciating it a little bit more than I did previously because of that, you know, like really kind of thoughtful representation of abuse and how it actually works. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's actually pretty well done. So, OK, well done, Noel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> was it uh, it wasn't me. One of my favorite episodes. <laughs> no, no, no. I but just I mean, unpacked like, you, it. You, 
You did. You unpacked it for me. I mean, because as an episode, as a story in and of itself, I've never really enjoyed it that much. I do like certain things. I love Giles. Oh, my God. I love Giles that his nightmare is being lost in the stacks, that he can't read, that he can't access. The source of Giles' power is his knowledge, mm-hmm. which he gets from the books. And, and we already had that interaction previously with him and Jenny Callender, where he's talking about how much that knowledge means to him, yeah. how important, not just the knowledge itself, but the, the delivery method for the knowledge books versus computers, Mm -hmm. right? How important that is to him. And it is so central to who he is. And so I love that his biggest nightmare is, you know, not being able to read. That's what makes him afraid. That's what makes him, um, you know, kind of kind of worried. It's an identity thing, Mm -hmm. right? Because who is he if he doesn't have that knowledge or access to that knowledge? But then his real nightmare when he sees Buffy's tombstone, and he says, it's not her nightmare, it's mine. Yeah. You know, that 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 is the real nightmare, that he will fail her, that she will die the way that most slayers do Mm -hmm. at a young age in a brutal manner. Yeah. So I loved that. And I especially loved that as a a reflection of what the real father relationship is. Absolutely. You know, that that Hank may be, you know, the man who who, you know, assisted Joyce in giving Buffy (laughs) life. I'm not going to say he gave Buffy life. (laughs) Um, his part was was relatively, you know, inconsequential, <laughs> aside from aside from some basic genetic material. Um, but but Giles is the one who deeply cares for Buffy and who will feel her loss, her pain, um, everything, you know, um, and take that very personally. And I really I loved seeing that in him and seeing the way that he cares for her. Yeah, Giles is wonderful in this episode. He is a yeah. little bit cruel and snippy with Willow, though. Oh, Telling yeah. her to shut up. And I mean, I know that we're in a stressful situation, oh. but he's a little bit, he's just a little bit harsh with her. And, you know, you you mentioned Giles's kind of level, like there's this level of nightmare, right? Not being able to yes. read when he <laughs> reads five languages on a good day. Um, right. And but then his real, you know, the more severe nightmare is Buffy's death. Um, mm-hmm. There are sort of there are levels of nightmares. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Cordelia's nightmare apparently <laughs> is a bad hair day and then being dragged off to and bad clothing um, and being and in bad clothing. too. Yes. I mean, that was not a terribly stylish outfit. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but some of the nightmares, I mean, are a little bit, I want to say a little bit tamer than others. And I wonder if mm-hmm. part of Willow's nightmare scenario is having this friction with Giles. I mean, it's really minor, um, mm-hmm. but it's still there. You know, they usually are such a great team. And when we see yeah. inside Willow's locker, she has, I mean, she has a Nerf Herder sticker, and they're the band who does yes. the the, uh, the theme music. The theme song. But mm-hmm. um, there's also a photograph of Willow and Giles. <gasps> I did not notice yeah. that. It's, oh, man. There's a little photo of Willow and Giles. It's the only photograph in her oh, locker. My- God, how sweet. I think I think textually she has a little bit of a crush on Giles. We it's do visit so that cute. very lightly in season four, um, which is very, very cute. Um, but yeah, no, that's interesting because, you know, because she it's, it's this joke moment, right, where she says, how do we wake him up? What if we can't wake yeah. him up? And he just says, Willow, do shut up. Yeah. And so, I, I you know, I didn't f- read that as being particularly harsh, but being dismissed by Giles. Mm-hmm. You know, could be could be part of her nightmare, you know, that she's she feels that deeply. I mean, I don't know. I just I, you know, there is some I think it's interesting. Yeah. Um, And of course, we see most, you know, of the of the nightmare scenarios, we see mostly Buffy. I mean, Buffy, Mm -hmm. you know, the being buried alive fear. First of all, that that was genuinely terrifying to me. Yes, (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. real scary. Um, Yeah. But, you know, she also has the, you know, the classic didn't study for the history test, doesn't know where history is, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, (laughs) looks at her paper and says, at least my at least I know my name. Um, Right. And I'm just like, I can't write it. Can't write it down. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Bunny Winters. It's Bunny Winters, (laughs) which is absolutely 100 percent somebody's roller derby and or Buffy themed drag queen name. 
<laughs> right? Bunny winter? Come somebody. on. Yes, somebody has somebody, got that definitely. one. Um, mm-hmm. But there's just, you know, there's there are all of these things going on with Buffy. And, you mm-hmm. know, partly that's because she's our she's our titular character. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's not just her family dynamic. It's not just um, being powerless um, mm-hmm. you know, as the slayer being unable to right. to um, face down the master, being unable to, you know, knock out this monster that is chasing mm-hmm. her and Billy. I mean, she's got what it's like. It's like 75 fears of Buffy's that we get to see. And I think <laughs> right. that is really, you know, that's really, really noteworthy that she has mm-hmm. a lot of fear. She's yeah. going through mm-hmm. her life. Le- I mean, you know. Well, she's having nightmares every night. Mm-hmm. She's having nightmares about the master. I mean, and the fear, too, rising as a vampire. Oh, my becoming goodness. Becoming the thing that her destiny is all about, you know, killing, right? I mean, that was something that I think we didn't address, you no. know, really that much. We have her rising as a vampire. She touches her face. She says, don't look at mm-hmm. me. You know, um, that that there's a shame in there involved with um, with the idea of being a vampire, but she is also a vampire with a soul, though. She yes. has not changed internally. She's only changed externally. She's only got the, you know, like looking like a vampire. Mm-hmm. So that's also interesting. Yeah. And is this, I think this is the only time in the whole series that we see Buffy in vamp face. I think, yeah, that's I it. I think it is. I'm pretty sure that's yeah. it. Yeah. Of mm-hmm. all of our characters. That we get yeah, to see because we see face. pretty much everybody in vamp face eventually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> except Giles. I don't think Giles ever gets turned, although he does become a demon. So you know, in uh, in season I think four, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of different fears sort of woven into Buffy's experience, mm-hmm. and I like I like that idea that she's going from yeah. one nightmare to another to another to another, and they all mm-hmm. sort of have to come together. We didn't. We could talk a little bit about Xander. I feel like mm-hmm. we get some pretty shadowy shadow Xander. Um, yeah, we do. I've I've pretty much filled my entire arc the patriarchy segment about Xander. So you want to go ahead and hop to that? Yeah, let's. I mean, <laughs> let's talk about the patriarchy. Let's talk about Xander and the patriarchy. I mean, let's talk. Xander is the delivery system of the patriarchy. Oddly enough, for uh, for um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, because he just like we have this moment in the opening, right? That's supposed to be this really cute thing. He doesn't remember a, an exercise, an active listening that he did with the teacher mm-hmm. because she was wearing a tight sweater because boy can't think around boobs (laughs) and it's funny right and willow and buffy laugh about it because it's cute and again boys will be boys Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but he he remembers the sweater though oh yeah no he does the mental catalog of of sweaters yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. it's not good and then at the end we have willow asking him if he still liked buffy when she was a vampire and he says, no, she was grotesque because her only value is in her beauty, you know? And then the fact that he still liked her, even when she was a vampire, actually speaks well of Xander. But his response, I'm sick. I need help. Because he was attracted to an ugly woman. Jesus fucking Christ. I don't even know what to do with yeah, that. Yeah, I... You know, and I mean, the only redeeming bit there for me is Willow saying, don't I know it? He says, I need help. Right. And she says, right. don't I know it in this friendly way? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. kind of like, um, I mean, it's not, I guess it's not really redeeming because it's just Xander will be Xander. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right. just like, well, this is who Xander is and he's not going to change. Um, mm-hmm. I do... In the absence of all of the the grossness between yes. Xander and Buffy, I do like the idea that he would still find her attractive as a vampire. That yeah. there would be that little like, yes, okay, you know, <laughs> yes, I still find her attractive as a vampire. <laughs> like, I well, yeah, but also it has this kind of fetishy element to it as well. Like Ooh, yeah. that he's attracted to her as a vampire yeah. as like a fetishy thing and still as much as liking her because she's pretty is not about her. You know, liking her because she's a vampire in this fetishy way yeah. is also not about her and it's not it's not good. It's not a great look for Xander. No. We're really not not doing well with Xander in this no. episode. 
Although we do get a good moment when he punches the clown in the face. Yes. Right. He stands up to his fears. <laughs> so that is a good moment. Anyone can make a giraffe. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's very cute. Yes. And it's nice to see him. Yes. He's the first one to stand up to his fears mm-hmm. in this. And, you know, gives us the key to Billy, right? Although if he'd stood up to the clown and the clown disappeared, the clown gets knocked out. Yeah. But he doesn't disappear. Like if he stood up to the clown and the clown disappeared, that would give us, you know, that would be like, oh, that's the key. Right. We have to face our fears, right? Um, you know, which is, uh, which would be like, I think a, a tighter telling of this story if that was the key. Yeah. That, that, let us understand um yeah but but it's it's not we don't really address it it's kind of just played for laughs yeah. although you know it's funny we get xander's um fear of nazis well let's talk about yes. fear of spiders and and uh xander says well there were a bunch of nazis crawling all over my face i mean right and then there's the swastikas on the wall right. when he's chasing the the chocolate bars and i also thought that was interesting because here's his nightmare he's following something he loves chocolate bars straight to his doom and i think that that is a you know again death of the author i don't think this was intentional but it's exactly that shadow xander stuff that he loves yeah. which is the source of his doom yeah yeah it's the sweetness it's the mm-hmm. sweetness that will that will get you. Um, yeah. But we have the so we have the swastikas painted on the walls. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Which for me was another chilling moment when he comes into that hallway and those those uh, yeah. graffiti's there. Yeah. When he punches out the clown um, mm-hmm. over his shoulder on the wall in the same spot where the swastika was at the beginning of the of that sequence yeah. uh, is a poster about vandalism, anti-vandalism. Oh. <laughs> So, so in the same spot, they replaced the swastika with a poster of, about anti-vandalism um, right after he punches the clown. As he punches the clown. I'm not sure it's the same spot. But in it's, the in, it's set, in the same kind of visual same, space. Same visual space. Right. Same spot. Oh, frame. that's interesting. You know, and I mean. Because that's empowering fighting against the swastikas. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could have been. Oh. Na- it, it's not an anti fascism poster but uh, that wouldn't have read as well in 1997 i think as it would in 2018 which we got work to do white people oh, man. i know <laughs> like, we got a lot of people, work to do we have work to do <laughs> white people. oh god Yes. Yikes. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, all right. Yeah. So now let's just. This is my one escape from that during the week. So I'm going to go right yeah. back into. The story. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry. Sorry, Betty. <laughs> no, it's all right. I just. I, I. I really. I really like my escapes from the reality of our reality. So let's go into the reality. <laughs> that of was a nightmare reality. Um, yeah. <gasps> it is a night. This Lonnie, is a nightmare reality. Are we in somebody's oh nightmare? <laughs> I think so. we're definitely in the darkest timeline. I definitely think Who's... that's the case. All right. Who's, whose know. nightmare are we in right now? That's what I want to know. And how do we wake them yes. up? But anyway, back to Buffy. Right. <laughs> Did you have anything else for the patriarchy? Oh, my gosh. Um, I zeroed right in on that doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, where is it? Let me find that line because I was ready to clock him. There, uh, Giles and Buffy are asking about Laura. And uh-huh. uh, the doctor says, she got off easy. Mm-hmm. And oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, we're setting up that there's a child in a coma. I get it. And mm-hmm. we're diminishing women's pain because it doesn't right. count unless he kills yes. you, apparently. Or you're in a coma. Yeah. If you're not as bad as, yeah, if you're not in that, then then every, the trauma that she experienced, what happened yeah. to her, is completely diminished by that. And diminishing women's pain is something we do all the time. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, what about Buffy with her dad? Don't get all blubbery yep. on me. Yep. Right? And making fun, I mean, even mm-hmm. making fun of uh, Willow's fear of spiders. Yeah. Xander... Mm-hmm does that little creepy hand motion on her when she's talking about spiders. Right. Mm -hmm. And she whirls around and he says, it's funny if you're me. Right. Which, Mm -hmm. all right, hello, toxic masculinity. Like, his his joke is more important Mm -hmm. than her legitimate fear. And then he later on, he doesn't let her get away with making fun of him for having been naked in class. Right. She says mm-hmm. she she enjoyed it. 
And uh-huh. <laughs> you know, she says it was, and he turns around, she says a bad thing. And he corrects her on that. He says, mm-hmm. he's like, no, you know, and that wasn't just a bad thing. And he, he really, um, he lets her have it there. Right. But she was about to say it was funny, but he looks at her. She reads his pain. She acknowledges it. And she says a bad thing, mm-hmm. right? She corrects herself. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't correct himself when dealing with her. No. Right. He thinks it's funny. Yeah. So, so yeah. Women's, so, women's pain, yeah. women's fear. Not important. Mm-hmm. No nope. big deal. It's all hysteria. Mm-hmm. It's all hysteria. Yep. Just because of that damn vagina. I gotta oh, my you. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what was the girl power moment of the week? Um, It wasn't a vagina moment, unfortunately. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, It was, I mean, I think Buffy, Buffy herself is our girl power moment. You know, mm-hmm. just throughout. She's just excellent right. throughout. Mm-hmm. But facing her mm-hmm. fears um, yeah. at the end mm-hmm. and taking on the monster as her vampire mm-hmm. self. Yeah. And I love what she says. I'll tell you, though, there are a lot scarier things than you. And I'm one of them. And she just pounds yeah. that guy. And I love it. Because in the in the earlier interaction in the gym, she couldn't fight mm-hmm. him, which I think was also part of her nightmare. Mm-hmm. But here she is claiming her power. You know, and I don't know if a slayer who has been vamped is like twice as powerful. Yeah. I would imagine it's cumulative. Yeah. Oh, that's got to be <laughs> that super strength. I'm just head cannoning right, right now is a status effect mm-hmm. that stacks. So you get your slayer yes. strength plus your vampire strength. And I think plus you, your vampire yeah, strength. I mean, and our, but it's her inner strength. It's her belief yeah. in herself. It's her. Yeah. You think you're scary. Mm-hmm. Just face me down. Right. You know, I love well, that. And. And symbolically, her willingness to be ugly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's accepted that with this power comes ugliness, that she may be perceived Mm -hmm. as ugly, and that's okay. She's not Mm going to be, um, she's not going to be polite. She's not going to be pretty. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. You know, it's like, damn right, she's scary. Let's own mm-hmm. that scariness. You know, things should be yeah. scared of her because she's absolutely powerful. God damn it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I really like that. I mean, we talked about female ugliness in the show, uh, making some space for that in the very first episode with uh, yeah. our first vampire, uh, Darla. Mm-hmm. I miss oh, her Darla. so much. A moment of silence moment for of Darla. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, so we get our our first vamp face is this is this young blonde woman. And then here we get to see Buffy in vamp face. And, you know, she's mm-hmm. you you said it already that her first remark is don't look at me. Yeah. Um, there's something about the the nightmarish quality of female ugliness. And yeah, I mean, look at Cordelia. Yeah. Right. Yep. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and even, I mean, even Willow, I'm head cannoning mm-hmm. that part of Willow's nightmare, her opera singing nightmare is the cultural appropriation involved in being <laughs> cast in Madame Butterfly. Yeah. Death of the author. <laughs> Death, of, <laughs> Death the of the author, author baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, that owning her power, owning her, her ugliness because she leaps mm-hmm. on him like a vampire. Yeah. She doesn't, yeah. um, mm-hmm. You know, she doesn't take him on with martial arts the way she does Mm -hmm. as a slayer. She does the vampire flying leap. Mm -hmm. There's something really um, monstrous about that. And she's using that. And I love it. Yeah, she takes it. She owns it, Mm -hmm. you know, and she takes this guy down with it, which I love. All right. So we're at the end of the discussion. Let me know, Noel. What's your favorite part? Um, It's the way Buffy speaks to Billy about what happened to him. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You were the only one playing. There wasn't eight other people on your team. Just the Mm -hmm. way she reframes that feels so perfect to me as a way to speak to a child in this situation to help him see the objective reality of what's going on. Um, Right. And it's something she couldn't do in her discussion with mm -hmm. Hank, 
right? Yeah. She couldn't look at him and say, so the failure of your marriage is, is my, my yeah. fault. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what you're telling me. Like, she doesn't question that at mm-hmm. all with Hank when he's being abusive to her. But when she's dealing with Billy, she's able to separate that out. Yeah. And she knows yeah. baseball. I like that. That yeah. there's just that that little indication that mm-hmm. she knows the game. Um, mm-hmm. So she can bond yeah. with him, you know, on that on that little point mm-hmm. as well. And I just love it. Yeah. No, I think that's really great. So what's your favorite part? Oh, God. Giles at Buffy's grave breaks my oh, heart yeah. every time. It is the most emotionally connected and real moment in this in this episode. It is. And it, it, it shows so much how deeply he's come to care for her, um, how he behaves the way a father should behave, mm-hmm. that this moment is you know, about like, it's, he makes it about him a little bit and how he's failed her. But it's because he loves her. It's because he cares about her. It's because doing right by her means so much to yeah. him. You know, and I love just that, that deep expression of that kind of love that Giles has for Buffy, you know, at this point in the story, which I just I, I love seeing that whenever we have those moments between Giles and Buffy, I always love them. And this is one of the first ones where where you see how deeply he cares for her mm-hmm. and how much he understands his role for her. Yeah. Yeah. That he's in the he's in that father figure role. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice. That's it for today. To join in the discussion on Twitter, follow Lonnie at Lonnie Diane Rich and me at Noella Loud and use the hashtag still pretty. You can also visit the Chipperish forums. Go to chipperish.com, click on forum and join in the fun. Or you keep Chipperish Media going to the tune of a dollar a month or more and gain access to the live chat in Discord where you can hang out with Noelle and me and all the Chipperish patrons who adore you. No more than I do, by the way. Visit patreon.com slash Chipperish to find out more. You can also show your support for Still Pretty by going to Apple Podcasts and giving us a review. That's one of the most effective ways to show support for your favorite podcasts. Or you can use your social media platform of choice to tell your friends. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Yes, we will be back next time with Out of Mind, Out of Sight, the 11th episode of season one. Until then, we're still caring about the spiders here. Let's not forget about the spiders. Spiders.